Hello everyone, today we're going to be going over the June 2025 Life Science Biology Regents exam. In this video, we're going to be focusing on the first cluster of questions, which are questions one through five, starting with number one, which asks us which claim about the kelp carbon pool is best supported by the evidence from the information in the model above. Okay, so the model above starts with this passage and then this illustration. The passage is titled Carbon, where does it come from, where does it go? And it reads that on Earth, carbon compounds are found in oceans, atmosphere, and living organisms, as well as stored in rocks and sediment. Earth and its atmosphere can be considered a closed system. The amount of carbon in different locations within Earth's system is always changing. Sea otters help maintain the carbon balance in their ecosystem. Otters eat sea urchins. Eating sea urchins is important as sea urchins are herbivores that can destroy a kelp forest. Kelp are large autotrophic algae that grow much faster than most plants. When kelp die, they sink into the deep ocean. The low oxygen conditions of the seafloor cause decomposition to be slower and complete. Scientists calculated the carbon pool, which is how much carbon kelp stores with and without sea otters as shown in the model below. So we know that otters are sea creatures. They're going to eat the sea urchins, so they reduce the sea urchin population, and sea urchins eat kelp, which is this long plant that grows in water. Okay, so sea urchins lower the kelp population. Okay, but otters maintain this balance by keeping the number of urchins low and the number of kelp higher. And we can see that with otters, the kelp carbon pool is higher, and without otters, the kelp carbon pool is lower, right? With otters, it's 101 to 180 grams of carbon. Remember that carbon is represented by the letter C. G stands for grams, so that's 101 to 180 grams of carbon. And without the otters, it's only 8 grams to 14 grams of carbon. So number one asks us which claim about the kelp carbon pool is best supported by evidence and information from the model above. And I'm going to go with choice number one, right? Choice one says that the carbon pool or the carbon storage is higher with otters present. Now I'm going to pause the answer choice here. Is that choice correct? Yes, with the otters, there's 101 to 180 grams of carbon. 101 or 180 is greater than 8 to 14. So this first part of the choice is correct. Then they justify it or they explain their choice by saying that it's higher because sea otters eat the sea urchins. That should make sense, right? Otters eat the sea urchins. Sea urchins eat kelp, okay? So if there are otters, the otters are going to eat all of the sea urchins. The sea urchin population will be small, and as a result, there's no one eating the carp, uh, the kelp. Remember that the kelp stores carbon within its leaves and stalk. So if not a lot of animals are eating kelp, that means that the carbon is staying within the kelp, okay? Because when the kelp is alive, it stores carbon, all right? Now, when there aren't otters, the sea urchin population skyrockets, and they eat all of the kelp. And as a result, the kelp forest is destroyed, said that up here meaning that there's no more kelp left and there's no more carbon left. Where did it go? Well, all of the sea urchins ate it. Right, choices two and three are wrong because the carbon storage is not higher with sea urchins present. As a matter of fact, they don't even tell you the carbon storage with sea urchins present. It's either with otters or without otters. Choice three is wrong because the carbon storage is not lower with otters present, okay? And choice four is wrong because even though the carbon storage is lower with sea urchins present, this part is true. The justification is false. Sea urchins do not carry autotrophic nutrition. Autotrophic nutrition is when you make your own food. If you read the passage, it said that sea urchins are herbivores. So if you're a herbivore, you don't produce your own energy and you cannot be an autotroph. You're either an autotroph or you're a herbivore. You can't be both. Number two says, which statement uses the model to describe how kelp contributes to a reduction of carbon entering the atmosphere? So I'm looking for a statement that proves how kelp reduces carbon entering the atmosphere. What's the atmosphere? It's the air around us, okay? So number one, to justify this, it says that kelp produces carbon as it grows within the hydrosphere. Now, if my goal here is to prove that kelp reduces carbon entering the atmosphere, would I support that statement by saying that kelp actually produces carbon? No. If kelp is producing carbon, it cannot be reducing it. So that makes no sense, right? If I want to prove the fact that kelp is lowering the amount of carbon, why would I ever say that it's actually increasing and producing carbon, right? Choice three, it says kelp produces carbon. Again, if kelp produces carbon, it's not going to reduce it. So that's why choice three is wrong. Choice four says some of the carbon stored in kelp is added to the geosphere through cell respiration. Again, the carbon stored in the kelp is added 
right? If you're adding carbon, how can you be reducing it? Now, you might be saying, well, let's add it to the geosphere. What is the geosphere? Well, if we look at a diagram of our planet, let's say everything is green is the land, everything in blue is the water, and let's say that this circle around it is the atmosphere, right? This is the atmosphere. So the geosphere is anything that occurs on land, the hydrosphere is anything that occurs in the water, and the atmosphere is anything that occurs in the air, okay? And finally, the biosphere is just everything, every living creature, okay? So even though kelp is adding carbon to the geosphere, even though the technically the carbon is going into the land, if we read the passage, we'd know that the amount of carbon in different locations within Earth's system is always changing, okay? So the geosphere is a part of Earth's system. So just because it entered the geosphere and not the atmosphere does not mean that it can't go back into the atmosphere from the geosphere. It's always changing. So you still added carbon. doesn't matter that you didn't add carbon to the atmosphere. If you added it to the geosphere, it will end up in the atmosphere. And that leaves us with choice two as the correct answer. It says that some of the carbon stored in dead kelp is trapped in the geosphere of the seafloor. Now think about it. If the carbon is trapped, if you're trapped, can you move? Can you escape? Can you go somewhere? No, you're trapped, okay? It's trapped within the geosphere. If you're trapped in the geosphere, that means that you cannot go anywhere else. So instead of this kelp dying and decomposing, and releasing carbon in the form of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it then becomes buried underneath the ground, right? And it's buried underneath the ground where it cannot break down. So instead of it breaking down into carbon dioxide in the ground and then seeping through the ground into the atmosphere, it's trapped there, okay? Again, the key word here is trapped. If you're trapped, you cannot transfer your carbon elsewhere. Number three asks us which model identifies the process that converts light energy into chemical energy inside the kelp. So we should know that when you convert light energy into chemical energy, that's going to be photosynthesis. Anything that uses light to create energy is photosynthesis. Now, what does photosynthesis need? Well, it needs light energy. So we can eliminate choices one and two because they don't talk about light energy. They talk about ATP, okay? Photosynthesis is driven by sunlight, okay? So if you ever see ATP over an arrow, that means that that process is driven or powered by ATP. If you see an arrow and it says electricity, that means that it's powered by electricity. If you see an arrow and it says light, that means that it's powered by light. And that's what happens in photosynthesis. So that's why I'm looking at choices three and four, because these show an arrow with sunlight, meaning that sunlight has to go in in order for the reaction to occur. Now, photosynthesis is when carbon dioxide combines with water and it combines with sunlight to produce a sugar and oxygen, which is O2, okay? So carbon dioxide plus water plus sunlight turns into glucose and oxygen. Choice three is our correct answer. Now, you might be asking me, what's glucose? Well, glucose is just a type of sugar, okay? So sugar and glucose... Same thing, it's just a more complex way of saying it, so remember that. Choice four shows the process in backwards. Right, number four says that, or it starts with this passage, so we'll read it. It says, increased atmospheric carbon dioxide has been linked to changes within marine ecosystems. When CO2, first of all, CO2 is, it just means carbon dioxide. You should know that for your exam. So when carbon dioxide combines with water, it produces carbonic acid, lowering the water's pH. Okay, so what is pH? pH is just a scale to show how acidic something is or how basic something is. So you know you should know for the regions that it's a scale from 1 to 14. If you have a pH of 7, that means you're neutral. Okay, anything less than 7 is acidic. Anything greater than 7 is basic. Okay, we're only caring about acidic here, so I'm going to ignore this part of the chart. So pretty much the closer you are to 1, the more acidic you're getting. Okay, so as, you're, as this pH number decreases, you're, it's more acidic. Okay, and that should make sense because as the CO2 combines with water, it produces carbonic acid. Remember, acid's low pH. So it says that a pH of less than 7.8 can interfere with the ability of some marine organisms to make shells and skeletons. These organisms include corals, mussels, plankton, sea stars, and sea urchins. The graph below shows the relationship between atmosphere, carbon dioxide concentration, and the pH of seawater. So this dashed line shows CO2. Okay, so What's the trend that we can see here? Well, the trend is that the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is increasing. Now, what is concentration? 
It's just how much of something is in an environment. So the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere just tells you how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. So if you have a high concentration, that means that there's a lot of things there. And we can see here that as this line increases, the concentration or the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will continue to increase. As this line is increasing, the connection you need to make here is that this line is decreasing. So as CO2 concentration increases, the pH continues to decrease and become more acidic. Okay, number four says if the trend in the atmos in atmospheric CO2 level continues, sea urchin populations may be impacted. Describe evidence from the graph that supports this claim. So first of all, what is the trend in atmospheric CO2 levels? Well, it's the fact that it's increasing. Okay, now connect the fact that this line will continue going up to the fact that sea urchin populations will go down or be hindered. Well, think about it this way, right? As this arrow goes up, this pH arrow goes down. So as, car as the concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide increases, the pH of the water will decrease. At a certain point, this pH will dip below 7.8. Why is that important? Well, a pH of less than 7.8 interferes, meaning that it stops or harms the ability of marine organisms to make skeletons, and some of those organisms are sea urchins. Okay, so to get full credit, you just need to state that if the carbon dioxide levels continue to increase, the pH of the ocean will continue to decrease past 7.8, and sea urchins won't be able to make skeletons anymore. Okay, so I'm going to just go ahead and quickly write that down. So I can say as CO2 levels continue to increase, the pH of the ocean will decrease um, at a certain point the pH of the ocean will decrease past 7.8 and sea urchins will not be able to create new skeletons, thus decreasing their ability to survive. If you don't have a skeleton, how can you survive? And that's going to decrease their populations, right? So that's all you have to say. You could have also said that um, as, the uh, as the ocean becomes more acidic, um, there's less carbon available for, oh, sorry, as, as the carbon dioxide level increases, pH decreases, pH less than 7.8 prevents sea urchins from making skeletons. You could also say that the graph projects that pH will decrease past 7.8. At that level, organisms won't be able to build skeletons, okay? That's all you have to say here. So finally, number five, it gives us this model. Okay, diagram shows information about the cycling of carbon. The model below shows the equation for how sea urchins make their shells. So calcium combines with carbonate or CO3 to produce calcium carbonate. Okay, so calcium, how do I know that? Well, it says that calcium ions and carbonate ions, this is calcium, this is carbonate, produce calcium carbonate, this is calcium carbonate. Number five says as ocean acidification increases, the amount of available carbonate ions decreases. Use the model and information provided to describe how cycling of carbon between the biosphere and at least one other sphere is affected as environmental conditions change. Well, first of all, what is the biosphere? The biosphere is all living organisms, okay? So the biosphere can be all sea creatures, all creatures on land, right? Any living thing on this planet. And what are our other spheres? Well, we have the atmosphere. So atmosphere. We have the hydrosphere. And we have the geosphere. Okay, so we just need to show how carbon entering or leaving one of these spheres will impact someone or some population within the biosphere. And we already know that as carbon enters the hydrosphere, right, as it enters the ocean from the atmosphere, right, it dissolves with water or it dissolves in water and it produces carbonic acid. Okay, we already know that from this passage up here. They just drew that out for us down here. When carbonic acid is in water, or when that carbonic acid is produced, it splits into bicarbonate ions. 
Now from here, there's no more arrows, so nothing else happens to it. And this passage up here didn't talk about bicarbonate ions, so we can go ahead and ignore this part. What we do know is that it also splits up into hydrogen ions. And these hydrogen ions combine with carbonate ions to make another bicarbonate ion. So as more carbonic acid is produced in the water, it's technically stealing up all the carbonate ions from the water because it's then combining with the hydrogen instead of these calciums to produce calcium carbonate, right? So if a bunch of CO2 dissolves into the water, there's going to be a bunch of hydrogen of these hungry hydrogen ions that are going to bind with all of the carbonate ions, right? And if you use up all the carbonate ions in the water, well, guess what? You can't produce calcium carbonate, which is required for a shell, okay? So what's the relationship here? Well, we can say that as atmospheric CO2 levels rise, the amount of CO2, oh sorry, of the amount of um, CO3 or carbonate ions, ions and the hydrosphere decreases, hindering or harming or stopping um, sea urchins and other marine animals from building shells slash skeletons. Right, so again, we need to show, we need to use this model or the information in this model or anywhere before this model as well to describe how carbon is cycled between the biosphere and at least one other sphere and how that's impacted as conditions change. So the environmental condition we're describing here is CO2 levels rising in the atmosphere. As CO2 levels rise in the atmosphere, that's our environmental condition, what happens to these other spheres? Well, as, atmos as CO2 levels increase in the atmosphere, the amount of carbonate ions in the hydrosphere decreases because all of these hungry hydrogen ions eat up all the carbonate ions. And then as there's a decrease in carbonate, the other marine animals cannot build their shells and skeletons anymore. Okay. You could also say that as carbonate ions are used to form bicarbonate in the hydrosphere, they're no longer available for sea urchin skeletons in the biosphere. You could also say that increased CO2 in the atmosphere causes hydro causes the oceans in the hydrosphere to become more acidic from carbonic acid. The decrease in the pH affects the organisms in the biosphere that need a certain pH range to survive. Okay, But again, that's all you need to know. Um, the only thing I would add to this answer is I would just say, uh, I would just include that there's sea urchins and other marine animals uh, in the biosphere. So you should specify that these animals are in the biosphere. You would get credit without it, but again, if you just mention that keyword, that, that'll that give you a better chance of scoring that point, right? Or your answer just being accepted by the grader. And that's all the questions from this section uh, reviewed. If you have any questions, please feel free to let me know in the comments below.